Dr. Stephen Kraft. He's the Dean of, of Stevens College of Business at the University of Montevallo. In this capacity, he's responsible for all academic programs in business and computer informatics. He's the founder of the Granger Center for Professional Practice, the Stevens College Inter Internal Career Preparation and Placement Center. Prior to this, he spent years in industry holding positions responsible for product development, advertising, and brand management. Dr. Kraft holds a bachelor's degree from Birmingham Southern College. He earned his MBA and PhD from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He has helped us uh, various times to understand various aspects of economics. And today, his emphasis is on the new capitalism. Turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have, I think, muted everyone. If you, uh, when we get to the question time, you have the ability to unmute yourself and ask a question at that time. So what I, I thought I would do is share a um, some 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 thoughts and then open it up for questions a little bit later. So we'd hold off on, on questions for right now. But I will go ahead and and since Phil brought it up and tell you, I had COVID this summer, so I've uh, I, I've had it and recovered. So I'll be happy to answer questions you have about the, the, the COVID experience. I don't recommend it if you're, if you're considering getting it. Uh, uh, try to avoid that. It, it was not a pleasant experience, although from all accounts, I had a very uh, mild case and, and was, uh, was very fortunate. But I, my 14 days went up July 2nd. So I, I, I was exposed and, and had it sometime in late June. So we just talk a little bit about the economy, about what's happening, and this idea of of new capitalism or a, a different take on capitalism than perhaps what we have grown accustomed to in recent decades. It is important to talk about. It is sometimes difficult to talk about without seeming like you are delving into politics. And so I will just apologize up front. If I, I step on your favorite economic theory, or or somehow um, uh, I, I don't mean to offend, but it's this it's hard to separate um, economics and, and politics completely. So this year, 2020, 2020 without COVID was probably going to be a recession year anyway, because of some economic headwinds that that the country has been facing, and it, it certainly. COVID has, has made the recession much, much worse and much more of, of a significant economic uh, event. But some things that sort of where we're facing, we have some changes in tax policy that have, have not been uh, positive for the economy in terms of how those tax cuts were targeted. They had a, a short-term stimulative effect, but a very significant long-term effect on the national or our budget deficit and, and on the national deficit. We had been involved in some productive talks for trade agreements, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which for political reasons we, we left and that was, um, that was not a positive development for the, the economy. It certainly hurt some specific industries in particular because we are, despite popular belief, the United States is actually a very significant manufacturing concern. You know, the, the, the colloquial wisdom you'll hear when you're talking to people is, well, the problem with America is we don't make anything anymore. We're, we're the service economy. We're not, you know, we're not involved in production. In fact, the United States is the world's largest manufacturer in relative terms and the second largest in absolute terms. We don't produce as much tangible products and goods as China but China has about three times our population. The United States is around 350 million. China has a little over a billion. So they're three times our size in terms of population and they barely out manufacture us. So on a per capita basis, on, on a relative basis, the United States is the world's largest manufacturing concern. And on, on an absolute basis, we're number two. And uh, that doesn't, they're probably not going to change anytime soon in terms of, of the relative ranking. Other economic developments is that we have been involved much more in recent years in applying tariffs, particularly to, to China. So you have to understand that a tariff is really a tax. 
So while one hand, you're maybe cutting income tax that affects individuals, mostly the higher income individuals, but we're at the same time imposing taxes on Americans through tariffs. And those taxes have been devastating and particularly in, in the farming communities and in, in manufacturing, it's had a detrimental effect. So we've, we've produced, a, put a lot more taxes on everyone and taken some taxes away from, from a, a smaller group. Uh, a tariff, so what is a tariff? A tariff is a tax that is applied to goods that come into the United States. Sometimes the way that it's not, I think, very well presented in the media, well, we, we, there's a tariff on Chinese goods so China pays that, right? No, China doesn't pay that. We pay that as, as US citizens. So it's a tax on the product coming in. It has you know, a, perhaps a minor impact on China, but its main impact is by causing goods and services, things that we want to buy in the United States to become more expensive. Now the hope, the intent is that you uh, make a Chinese good more expensive. People will buy less of it. China will then want to, to buy more of our goods or somehow behave in a way that, that we'd like to change. That relationship tends to be a little bit nebulous, but understand that when you hear we're putting a tariff on Chinese goods or on European goods or on something coming from outside the United States, that's a tax that you and I pay when we buy it. It's not a tax that that foreign entity pays. So we started this trade war with China, which was not by and large beneficial for us or, or really very successful. The result of, of all of these cumulative um, economic decisions, and, and there, there are cases to be made for each of these. That is, there are the reasons you might do this other than the, the economy. And so there may be, you know, you can, you can find someone who would certainly make an argument in favor. You know, it's a good thing that we're out of TPP. It's a good thing that we have tariff on Chinese goods. It's a good thing that we have, have targeted tax cuts. So there's, there's political arguments in favor of them. The economic argument, by and large, though, uh, would be that these, these are, are not beneficial to us as, as an economy. So what happened is that the U.S. budget deficit blew up in 2019. We reached a point where as, as, a, as a federal entity, and understand when I'm talking about the U.S. budget deficit, I'm not talking about states or municipalities or any, any subunits. I'm just talking about the Congress in Washington, the president, what they have spent relative to what they brought in in terms of, of revenue, which primarily comes from taxes. We hit a milestone in 2019 is that our structural budget deficit was a trillion dollars. So the United States government, the, the president and, and Congress spent a trillion dollars more than they brought in in 2019. That is absolutely the largest single year uh, budget deficit we've, we've ever seen. As a proportion of GDP, it's the highest in an expansion year. The only years that really compete with 2019 in terms of, of uh, budget deficit is um, the four years of World War II, where we were borrowing, you know, very significantly. So, that, so relative to GDP, we went into a lot of debt around World War II for obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, in terms of, of an expansion year where we're really not at war, we don't, we're not in a deficit, uh, 2019 was the largest uh, budget deficit year in our history. So because of that, and, and of course, you know, partially because of the, the response that's been required for, for COVID, our national debt has skyrocketed to about $27 trillion. Now, if you're like me, you may have a hard time conceptualizing just how big a number a trillion is. It's a big enough number that if you look up the definition on the internet, you'll find that different countries define the word trillion in different ways. They actually use the same word to, to mean different numbers. It's, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's such an abstract large number. You could think of it, or it's, it's, it's a million times a million. Um, the way I think it is perhaps easiest to uh, conceptualize a trillion dollars is say that 
you could go back in time to the day that Jesus was born. So you went back, you know, you're there, you got, you know, got, got the manger, you've got the star overhead, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards, the whole nativity scene, and you're there. And you're there and you're, you witness the birth. You're there for it. And you're so excited and you're, you're so excited about this that you go out and you spend a million dollars that day on frankincense and myrrh, whatever you're going to buy, you know, just, just for everybody. So you're, you're really excited. You spend a million dollars and you spend a million dollars the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day, all throughout recorded time and up to today, because you spent a million dollars today before this meeting, you still would not have spent a trillion dollars. You would not have yet have spent a trillion dollars. If you want to spend a trillion dollars, you actually have to go back to about 750 BC to the founding of Rome. You remember the, the myth, mythological story, the founding of Rome, Romulus and Remus, uh, you know, dad died, new father was going, you know, new husband was going to kill the babies, mom couldn't take it, so she put them in the woods, they were, you know, suckled by a wolf, and then a farmer found them being raised by wolves, you know, people always get raised by wolves in this, right, and so this farmer found them, took them in, raised them, they decided to found a city, they couldn't agree where to put it, they got into a fight, uh, Romulus killed Remus, and so that's why it's called Rome, because if you, you kill your brother, you get to decide what the name of the city is going to be, and they name it after you, and you go back to then, to the 750, you would have just barely spent a trillion dollars, a million dollars a day throughout recorded time. Our national debt is 27 trillion. Now, how does that fare relative to, and again, let me, let me point out, that is just the federal government debt. It does not count money owed by states. It doesn't count anything you know, a municipality owes because they built a new, um, you know, water treatment plant and they issued bonds. It doesn't count any of that. It doesn't count a public institution like my university where we have bonds, where we have, have built a building or, or done some other kind of a public works. It doesn't count anything at the state, county, uh, or municipal level. That's just the federal deficit. So the national deficit, if you count all the other municipalities and, and other kinds of, of sovereign debt, um, below the federal level would be higher, but just the federal deficit, the federal debt is $27 trillion. Just to give you some perspective of, of how that compares to the rest of the world, the entire sovereign debt for the world is about $69 trillion. So we're one of, I think, what, 154 nations that the UN recognizes as, 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 as countries. Um, but we owe 27 out of the trillion, out of the total 69, 27 trillion is owed by our federal government. So to say that we are significantly in debt, I think is, is, you know, um, uh, is an understatement. So you may say, well, you know, we've been, except for a, a few years during the, uh, you know, uh, during the eighties, we have pretty much been in debt my entire life, your entire life, you know, as it, you know, does it really make that much difference in terms of, of what we owe? At some point it does. And we are probably at that point. What we're seeing now is that in our, our the function in terms of how we, we finance this debt is that we issue treasury bonds. And we invite people around the world, both in the United States and other places to come in and, and buy these bonds. And as long as they do, we can keep refinancing this debt because in 2019, it wasn't just the trillion dollars of our, of our budget deficit that we had to finance through the treasury bonds, but we also had to roll over because every year, some of the bonds that we issued 30 years ago come due. And so we're constantly having to refinance our prior debt. The problem becomes as people become around the world become suspicious of buying U.S. sovereign debt because we owe so much and because of some you know, perceived political instability in the United States, we have to pay up. So the, what you see is that the interest rate that we're having to pay on treasury bonds to attract the money to refinance our sovereign debt and finance our new debt because we're still spending a lot more than what we're bringing in 
those interest rates are going up and up and up. We're having to pay higher and higher and higher amounts. So over time, if this continues and we don't have more fiscal sanity, the, the interest rate that we're paying on our national debt is going to go higher and higher and higher. And servicing that debt is going to require a higher and higher percentage of our, um, of our the income, essentially the, the tax base that flows into to Washington. So if you can imagine, you know, your, your, your family and you have a, uh, a, a mortgage on your home and you're able to make those payments, but every year the interest rate goes up a little bit and goes up a little bit and goes up a little bit. Suddenly the payment on your house is going to be a larger and larger and larger and larger and larger proportion of your income. And then you decide, you know, you're going to bring in less income. In this case, by by giving a, a tax uh, tax breaks to to you know to, to rich folks, then it's it becomes that much harder to to pay the debt. So that's that seems to be the spiral we're in, and that's that's the that's the challenge. So this year, 2020 was likely to be a deficit year anyway. You saw some petering out of job growth. We had good low unemployment. Uh, we have had for about eight years. But in terms of the, the nature of the jobs that have been created in the last few years, tend to, we're not as strong, we're not as high paying, and the, the speed of job creation has slowed considerably over the last four years compared to what it had been in the, the period around the recovery in, say, say 2010 to 2015, where we had some really amazing and significant uh, job growth. Stock market has done well. I'm sure if, you're, if you've watched your, um, your, your uh, portfolios that they, they should have performed well. Uh, the, the stocks have, have been good. The stock market is not the economy. It is, it's an indicator of how a, a sector of the economy is, is doing. But um, that is, that's sort of the bright spot is that the stock market seems to be uh, uh, going well and it's, and it's sort of trucking along uh, rather, rather nicely. COVID-19. I've had COVID, again, I don't recommend it. As, as an economic impact, I don't think you can, can overstate this. And you all remember the 2007 uh, Bush era recession and the, what they call the, the Great Recession. The interesting thing is, is how these change in terms of, of, of demographic. Uh, people in some circles started, had referred to the 2007 recession as, as a man session because the impact on male employees was significantly greater than it was on women, largely because of the, um, uh, the industries that were hit. It did, you know, 2007 hit construction really hard. It hit male dominated industries. It did not have a strong effect on service industries and fields where you know, there are a lot of, of, of women are, are employed. This is having just the opposite effect. So. What we're seeing now is that the unemployment rate among women has been, have been hit particularly hard. Obviously, I mean, you know, I don't need to tell you, the service industry has been devastated. Restaurants, retail, which was already under a lot of, of pressure, have been hit really, really hard by COVID-19. There is an argument about how many of these jobs are going to come back when COVID starts to, to find relief, and some of them will, some of them won't. We know that we have, there are a lot of businesses that we have lost that probably will never come back. Um, something else will spring up in, in their place, but, uh, but for right now, that is, um, you know, we, we're expecting to see some real and lingering economic pain in, um, in the job market for, for foreseeable future. Now, the, the interesting thing, and this is something that may be more interesting to me than anybody else, because you know what I do, I'm the dean of, of a business school, but in both 2007 and in uh, the current uh, 2020 uh, economic crisis, the, the interesting thing is that uh, despite what you may hear in, in the popular media and sort of the, the narrative that, that has become very common, people with college degrees have actually fared pretty well. If you look at the unemployment rate, both from the, if you look at the, say, the, the recovery period 2010 to 2015, and you look at, there's a group in Georgetown that, that did an analysis of, of that job recovery period. And they looked at oh, 2000, basically 2010, 2015, 
and they looked at who has a good job. Now, you can argue with their definition of a good job. The way they defined it was a good job was 50000 a year uh, in salary with uh, retirement benefits and, um, uh, and health benefits. I know you can argue with that and say, well, you know, I think 45 a year with those benefits is, is, is a pretty good job, and, and I would agree with you. That's the definition they chose. But it, so if you look at uh, comparing over time, what they found is actually in 2015 during, again, this is, they looked at this data because this is just a remarkable period of job growth. In 2015, there were actually fewer people with a high school degree in the United States that, were, that held a good job. If you look at associate's degree, so someone with, with a two-year degree, there were about 150,000 more. So in a country of 350,000, that's not 350 million, 150,000 is not that many, but there were more people with good jobs uh, that had an associate's degree. There were 2.7 million more people with college degrees that had good jobs at the end of that period than they had before. So going to college real, and getting a college degree it really is sort of, sort of the, the keys to the kingdom in terms of getting your um, getting a foothold in, in the middle class. We see that same thing now. If you look at the uh, relative unemployment rate by education level, what you find is that people with, with a college degree is are, are ultimately uh, the unemployment rate is much lower than it is if, if, if you don't have a college degree. So the way I look at it is, you know, we're in this we're in, we're in a, a large game. You know, we're, we're in the Super Bowl, and at some point you have halftime, right? And the players go off the field and J-Lo or somebody comes in and, and you know, performs and there's, there's music. And then the game starts back again. I think the, the economic recession, both, both the 2007 and our current economic crisis, whatever nickname they end up, you know, the, the, the COVID crisis, wherever they end up calling this thing, uh, both of these are, are halftime in a larger macro game. And the game is that we have a profound talent crunch. If you look at the size of the baby boom generation and how they are retiring in very, very large numbers, leaving the job market in very, very large numbers, and we, we simply don't have enough people coming behind them with the right skill sets. And so we, it, it's, it's, it's caught, you know, we have these, these periods where yeah, and it's, it's maybe challenging to find a job right this minute, but this is, again, halftime and a larger macro game where we don't have nearly enough people with the, with the right talent uh, in, in, in skilled areas. That is, right now, if, you know, for example, someone with a, and this is very, very particular to, to my world, someone with a PhD in accounting, they're around uh, 200 new degrees minted every year in accounting. So there's there about 200 people in the United States who are gonna graduate with a PhD in accounting and probably 400 with that degree are going to retire. So if you have a PhD in accounting, which if you're thinking about getting a PhD in accounting, I encourage you to do so. But if, you, uh, if, you, if someone with a PhD in accounting can essentially call any, in any accredited business school in the country and probably the dean will hire them on site. It, and we have profound areas of talent crunch, certain areas of engineering, not all engineering. We have certain areas of engineering where there are profound talent crunches, certain specializations among uh, physicians. We have severe talent crunches, uh, computer informatics, people who can work with large data sets, severe uh, talent crisis. Now, you may ask, well, how can we have both, you know, a, a challenge to find talent and any unemployment? Well. The reason is because there, there's oftentimes a mismatch between those people who are unemployed and the jobs that we have. The other is, and just speaking very, very frankly, this is a problem particularly in Alabama, although it's not unique to Alabama, it's a particularly Alabama problem. The issue we have is sobriety. It is in the state of Alabama, this state, I know not all of you are sitting in Alabama, but I'm sitting in Alabama and I know many of you are sitting in Alabama, but in the state of Alabama, right now, if someone finished high school and did not go on to college, so someone with a high school degree in Alabama applies for a 
semi-skilled or skilled manufacturing job. 80% of those applicants in Alabama will fail simple drug screening. Eight out of 10. Now, the article you see in, in, on the news is that, hey, you know, uh, you know XYZ company put out an, an, you know, an, a job posting today and you know, 200 applicants showed up. What they don't tell you is that 200 applicants showed up and they deliberately put the meeting at 11 o'clock and they told them, all right, now go grab some lunch and afterwards we're going to do a drug test and 15 came back afterwards. That's the problem. That, that's how you can have, that's, there, you have mismatch of skill sets, but we also have a, a profound addiction problem. And this is a situation where you know next week someone's going to ask you to pee in a cup and they're going to test you for drugs and you can't clean up long enough to go through through that test. And I, I didn't believe those numbers when people told them to me, but I, I heard it from a couple of companies. And so I talked to our economic development people with the state, they confirmed it. I've talked to dozens and dozens of, of, of hiring managers and CEOs at all kinds of, of manufacturing and production and, and service industries. And they all tell me the same thing is that the, the, the rampant, you know, if, if you have a multi-million dollar piece of equipment and you want someone to have a high school degree and be sober when they operate it, that it is a profound problem finding people who meet those qualifications who will come to work and, uh, and, and, and actually work. So it, it's, that's, that's, where, that's where we're at in terms of, of talent. So we have these, these halftime moments where we have uh, the, the 2007 great, um, uh, great Recession. We have our current uh, recession that is exacerbated by COVID-19. And so in these moments, uh, it, is, it is challenging for some folks to find a job. But generally speaking, we have a profound talent crunch. And if someone's not able to find work, it's probably because their skill set is, is mismatched. I will tell you, coming out of my college right now, the student graduates without a job, they don't want one. We have more jobs than, than we have students, particularly in the areas of, of accounting and marketing. But, but we, have, we, have, we have profound need for, if I could, I could double the size of our accounting program right now and, and place everyone easily. So it's, it's just a matter of having the right people with, with the right skills. So what is, you know, when we talk about this, this, this new capitalism and having to look anew at, 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 at how we have traditionally looked at this, part of this is understanding what our models are and understanding how the, the economy works. One of the, the economic models you hear about in, uh, in, in really since, you know, since the 80s, at least, it's been a, a prominent idea is this, I, this idea of supply side economics. And that if you have enough capital accumulation in a smaller number of hands, that that will result in the kind of business growth that ultimately create jobs. Now, one of the underpinnings of this, and I'm going to share a screen with you really quick and I'm not going to go professor on you but I have to do I'm a business professor I have to do you have to indulge me let me do at least one one chart while we're uh, while we're talking here so I'm going to share this so you should be able to see you should see a, a white screen that on one axis is tax rates and the other axis is, is tax revenues so the idea of, of a Laffer curve is that you've got you know a tax rate at the bottom of zero, and I apologize for my uh, poor computer penmanship here, and then a tax rate of 100%. So, and then this is the tax revenue. So this would be, this would be down here, we're looking at dollars. So if you had say an, an economic entity and the total income was a million dollars, just to make the numbers easy, we'll say that we have an economy that's worth a million dollars. So if the tax rate is zero, then you're going to bring in zero dollars. So 0% 0 tax, dollars. So say that the tax rate is 10%. So if it's 10%, you're gonna bring in say $100,000. If it's 20%, you're gonna bring in $200,000. That's 20% of a million. And you keep going up until you get to 
So what, how much tax revenue would you be bringing in when you got to 100%? Well, you might say a million dollars, but would you? That is, would you continue working if you were being taxed at 100%? Probably not, the theory goes. So in fact, if you get to the tax rate to 100%, your revenue goes back to zero. So the thinking goes that there must be a curvilinear relationship. We don't know what it looks like, but there must be a curvilinear relationship somewhere in here so that at some point in the process, as the tax rates go up, you'll notice that the tax revenues go down. That at some point, if you tax people enough, it'll be a disincentive to work and they won't go into work. And so we'll actually bring in less revenue or the counter, you know, sort of the, the other side of way of looking at that is, is that if the tax rates up here, it's entirely possible that if we lower the tax rate, we'll actually increase revenue. The problem, and so this, this has been the animated, it's called the Laffer curve. And this has been, and, and it's probably the, the, the story, at least the apocryphal story is that the first Laffer curve the curve was drawn around the bottom of a martini glass, which might be instructive in terms of, of, of how this idea got developed uh, with, with, with drunk people. But this, uh, it, it, it's, it's elegant and it makes uh, perfect sense when someone explains it to you. The problem we have with the Laffer curve is that it doesn't work. It's because the way that our taxes are, are progressive in nature, that is, uh, because if you if your tax rate jumps from you know eighteen percent to twenty four percent, you're not paying twenty four percent on all the money. You're just paying twenty four percent on the marginal dollars that increase. Did this work? This doesn't work. So the Laffer curve doesn't work. We've tried it. We've tried it. We've tried it. You can't. We had a huge you know experiment with this in in Kansas a few years ago that basically wrecked the the economy in in Kansas. You do not increase tax revenue by decreasing tax rates. You can't find any examples where that has ever worked in any kind of, of, of meaningful way or where you can attribute you know, any kind of additional revenue to, uh, to, to, to tax cuts. So it, it's a model that we've been talking about since the 80s and surely it just makes so much intuitive sense. The world must work this way, but it just doesn't. I mean, it, it, we can't find, there's no evidence that, that, that it works. So the other underpinning idea behind supply side is, you know, you've got that, that you can lower tax rates and increase tax revenue. The other, the other problem with the, the other underpinning of, 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 of supply side is the idea that if I am, I, I, you know, I'm successful and I am an entrepreneur and I own a company, that if you put more money in my hands, that I will then turn around and use that money in ways that create jobs. And then since there are more jobs, more opportunities, those, those economic opportunities will trickle down because I, I have, I've accumulated more wealth, that those economic opportunities will trickle down to other people in the economy and you know, raise all the boats, how the, you know, the tide gets higher and, and raises all boats. Again, the problem is with the relationship between my capital accumulation, if I'm a person of means, and the jobs, that that relationship is ultimately doesn't really exist. Um, what, we've, what the numbers tell us is that if I accumulate additional wealth, 86% of that is going to go to a process of trading securities and investments back and forth with other people of means and only 14 percent is actually going to get applied to something that might produce a job so if you know a bank suddenly we know for example that during the the 2007 um, you know as, as a result of the 2007 uh, economic crash uh, we put a great deal of, of, of federal capital into the banks. And so there were, there, were, there were assets that were removed into banks. Banks suddenly had access to a lot more capital and that was very inexpensive, provided by the federal government with a free reign in terms of, of how they use it. And again, very little of that went into any kind of, of lending or other sorts of, of, um, uh, of activity that might, um, 
that, that might result in a job. You know, you've probably all seen, you know, the, uh, the It's a Wonderful Life, the, the, the movie where you have the, the building alone and people put their money in the building alone and George Bailey lends it out and they build houses and, and jobs gets created. Uh, real banking in, in the modern economy doesn't work that way. Uh, they, the banks don't necessarily take the money that it accumulates in a bank and lend it out in ways that are going to necessarily create jobs. And when it does happen, even when that 14% happens, where there, there is that, that part of the money that gets used to, for additional economic activity to, to create jobs, uh, there's no guarantee those jobs are going to be in the United States. So there, there's, no, there's no way, there's no mechanism to, to tell us or ensure that somehow that those jobs get created, get created here or in a way that you know, if, if, we're in, if we're making the investment, that we are going to, to reap the benefit. So ultimately, you know, I think um, we need a new conceptual model about how the economy works that, is, uh, that, that supply side is, is simply doesn't, doesn't hold water and it doesn't, uh, our, our economic history doesn't, uh, doesn't support that it's, that it's effective or it does, doesn't, doesn't illuminate our understanding of how the, the economy works. So if you go back to this, this idea of, uh, to say a few words about um, mass production and, and in terms of the old economy and how we understood it, you know, there's a, a company that produces goods and, or services and we consume them. Now, Gandhi was, you know, observed this, this notion of, of first taking uh, hold in India, this idea of, of mass production is, and he saw it very much as uh, counter to, to an artisan culture that he very much supported and was part of. So you've got, imagine a lot of people sitting around making clothing and making shoes. And suddenly, you know, Gandhi sees the mass production. And he was of the belief that mass production carried within itself the seed of its own destruction. Because if you suddenly take you know, all, you, know, you had a you know, hundred people making clothes, and now you can make the same clothes with 10 people in a factory as you could with 100 people sitting around, you know, acting in sort of an artisan fashion and sewing the clothes. Well, how are those other people who are now unemployed going to buy clothes? If you, if you take everybody out of production, you only have a few people producing, there's nobody left to buy the stuff. Well, what, what Gandhi didn't have the benefit of, of the, you know, the generations of, of economic history we've had uh, since, since his life and the idea of the growth of consumerism. And the fact is, well, maybe they're not making clothes anymore, but they're gonna make other things we want, you know, electronics, iPhones, um, you know, uh, better food, nicer clothes. We're gonna have more clothes than we used to have. We're gonna have more shoes than we used to have. We're gonna have bigger homes. The idea that, that we're going to have more economic specialization, which is not something that, that Gandhi you know, could, could conceive of. So it turned out, you know, in the short term, at least, Gandhi was wrong. The question is now, with the growth of artificial intelligence and robotics, are we gonna come back and figure out maybe Gandhi was right all along? Because you, you hear a lot of conversations about, well, we need to get out of this trade agreement or that trade agreement because China is stealing American jobs, Mexico is stealing American jobs, American jobs are going to, uh, to, to other parts of the world. And that might've been a legitimate concern in the 90s. Today, you are much more likely to have jobs lost to automation and artificial intelligence and robotics than you are internationally. That's, what's, that's what is, is depriving us of skilled manufacturing jobs is the growth in automation and artificial intelligence. And the question becomes, are we going to reach a point where we really don't need everyone involved in, in production in order to produce everything we need. And what do you do with those people who are, who are not working? Not working because they're retired, just not working because they're not needed. And what kind of, of, of civil unrest does that create if we have mass unemployment because we can have you know, a relatively small number of people producing all the goods and services we need, but how do other people buy them? And that's the, that's the challenge that I think that, that we're facing is we, the, the cost of, of energy is consistently going down and down and down. 
uh, the quality of renewable energy is getting better and better and better. The production cost of renewable energy is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, the ability to produce the consumer goods we need uh, is getting easier and easier and easier and more and more automated. But what do we do with all these people who we don't need to have involved with the um, uh, with, with the with the economy? So that's the uh, that's that's one of the challenges. And there are, there are different models that are people are playing with uh, parts of the world where they're experimenting with uh, minimum guaranteed incomes, where we're looking at where that's done in the form of, of tax credit or actually direct payments uh, to individuals. It's a very controversial. Uh, idea as whether we're just going to, to pay people. You know, the, the argument is, why you're just going to pay people to not work? Or well, we're going to allow people <coughs> to live. And then if they, if they do work, if they have that opportunity, there'll be, there'll be economic advantages. But if someone really can't work, or if, if, they're, if they're not needed, or their skill set is not there, at what point are we going to set, you know, are we going to be the culture that sets people adrift and, and not support them? So that's the, those are some of the challenges that, that, that we're looking at. So the, a, a new, this idea of, of a new kind of capitalism, I think goes back very much. Some of you may remember, I think it was 1970. I think it was 1970. It could have been 71 or 72, but it was around, around that era. Milton Friedman published a, a, a widely cited and still discussed um, uh, editorial in the New York Times, where he made the case is that the business of business should be to make money. And this idea that, you know, companies had a responsibility beyond making money was, was, was foolish and inappropriate. You know, people have responsibilities, but companies should only you know, spend their time making money. Now, the, the counter argument, some people, you know, attribute to, um, Rockefeller, other people who've written about, you know, businesses having you know a greater social responsibility beyond simply um, the money getting. But a lot of people have, have written about that, so there's not necessarily a, a central focus of the figure that would be would be counter. But but Friedman's idea, which held certainly was very influential and and held a, a great deal of um, of, um, of of sway in the 80s and 90s in particular, is. Um, is probably ultimately losing that battle right now. Uh, most companies and most uh, business executives, large organizations, see themselves very much as having a, a, a social responsibility. Um, what are the obligations of business to their employees? What um, you know? How how are we going to deal, for example, with systemic risk and who's allowed to take risk? You know, do you we, we, you know, part of the, the backbone of our economic system is that we want to encourage people to take risks. So you imagine a, a, a mom and pop a retail store on a corner somewhere, maybe a, a small market uh, retail store somewhere, and you, you know, the family owns this and they're, they're working hard, you know, mom, dad, kids working in the business every day, and they take a risk. And if things go well, they're wildly successful. And maybe they'll end up, you know, franchising and having other other locations. But they get to to really, you know, put their you know blood and sweat equity into to building a business. And we're you know we 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 we're proud of those people. We're excited about them taking that risk. Does the the question? If they're if they're not successful, then they can you know no no harm no foul, come back a couple of years and try again. Most people who are successful entrepreneurs are not successful in their first try. They're successful in their fifth, sixth, seventh try. They've, they've tried things before and they keep trying, keep trying. You know, that's the, the indomitable American spirit that we're all also proud of. The question is, is a company like Citibank simply a bigger version of a mom and pop store? That is, it's one thing when a family takes on a certain risk to build a family grocery store. It's another when a large corporation like Citibank takes on risk in such a way that it perhaps puts the entire economic system at, at, at risk. The United States, we have not made those kinds of, of distinctions. 
and other parts of the world they do. Germany does, for example. Germany looks at the, the, at systemic risk and what's a risk appropriate for a very large company compared to the risk for a middle sized uh, company versus versus a small business. Um, so we have there. There's work to be done in terms of figuring out who are we going to empower to take systemic risk. You know, if your organization is is large enough, if you are, you know, Facebook and Instagram, can you take the same kind of risk? If your Citibank, can you take the same kind of risk? Can Citibank take the same kind of risk as a mom and pop grocery store? So. Um, this idea that, uh, that that businesses as 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 corporate citizens is, I think, is it, there's there's a shifting, and the idea that the purpose of business is not simply to to make money, uh, but there is there's a larger purpose. There are responsibilities that businesses have toward their uh, toward their employees, toward certainly toward toward the shareholders and the owners to give a, a an equitable rate of return. But if necessary, to perhaps subjugate uh, profits to the welfare of the community and to the welfare of their employees. Now, you may argue that you know, there, there's there's a cynical argument to be made. Well, that this idea is shifting because employees are demanding it, and that's true. And if you talk to a, um, I've been in higher ed for for a lot of years. Uh, when I first started teaching, I don't think my students were that concerned with the ethical um, uh, perspective or, or the social conscience of the companies they went to work for. They wanted to make as much money as, as they could. Uh, that's not true today. The students that, are, that I work with today universally are asking very tough questions during interviews about how the company conducts its business. They want to work for companies that, are, that are, they deem socially responsible. Now it's an eye of the beholder standard, but it is, it's what students are, are demanding, it's what employees uh, by and large are demanding. And, un and understand that, um, understand that the, uh, there's some background noise from somebody. Uh, understand that the, sorry, hang on a second. The dishwasher and nearby the kitchen uh, understand that the, Yes. You mute everybody again. Now, compared to a prior generation, are very much in the position. Because remember, our macro game we talked about that we have this, this large talent crunch. So, how this affects something like economic development? You know, there was some criticism of uh, the Alabama governor when we brought in Mercedes because you have, we're going to give you the, the typical economic development plan uh, is we're going to give this company tax incentives. They're going to come here. They're going to build a plant. They're going to build an operation. Lots and lots of people are going to, to get jobs. And so it's worth it to us to give them some sort of tax incentive to come here. It was a great deal. I'd cut that deal. I'd cut that deal every day of the week uh, in order to get a, a major company to move into the area. But that's been the model of, of economic development. The problem is that in the past, it would work because if you, you had a company set up, you know, like a Mercedes set up operation, tons and tons of people would be willing to relocate and come to that space and, um, and, and live there and, and work and, and provide the labor. They don't have to do that anymore. The generations of students that we're, that we're dealing with now understand they've hit the demographic lottery. They're not going to go where the jobs are. They're going to go where they want to live, and the jobs are going to follow them. If you're a young person in college today, if you decide that you want to live in Des Moines or New York or Chicago or wherever, you just pick up and move, and then you pick up the paper. You know how people in cities used to look for apartments? You get the obituary, see who died that day, and go see if you can get their apartment. Do that with jobs. Just show up, and probably there are going to be five baby boomers with the job you want that retired today. Just go take their job. It is just just move there and do it. Uh, the plus so much of the work that we do now is is digital. I mean, I'm talking to you from Vestavia Hills. I could be talking to you from Russia right now on Zoom, and you know you you wouldn't know it. It'd be it'd be just like slight like being here. Um, so much is, is digital. So much is mobile. 
you know, in, in the, the result of COVID, you see more and more people abandoning um, cities. There are now actually, it's easy apparently right now from what I hear to find an apartment in New York where it has in the past, it's, it's been impossible. People are, are abandoning cities because of, of COVID. Uh, this young people can live pretty much where they want to. And like I said, just pick up the paper, find the baby boomers that retired or died that day that have the job you want and go take it. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, sort of the outline of, of this idea. We don't know what the new capitalism going, is going to look like. Uh, work is going to be different than it has been. The options that young people have are, are different than they, they, they have been. Uh, I will, will just tell you straight up that you're going to hear stories about uh, how awful millennials are, how entitled they are. There, I, I will confess, I have, I have heard that about every generation that has ever gone through college. I heard the same thing about Gen X. I, my colleagues told me they said the same thing about baby boomers. Every, every generation thinks the next one is spoiled and, uh, and, and, and lazy. So this is just, just par for the course. So the things you hear about millennials, by and large, are not true. They're, they're really salt of the earth kids. Uh, and their, their technical skills are uh, amazing. And they, they, their work attitude is amazing. You'll hear accounts in the press where, you know, or you'll hear your friends say, yeah, my, my granddaughter or my friend's daughter went to, you know, this uh, fancy college is now $100,000 in debt with a degree they can't get a job in and living in mama's basement. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. It does happen. But by and large, students who study in, in demand career fields, graduating from college today, even in the area in the era of COVID, uh, have unprecedented opportunities. And so if you, if you, if you know, so if, if you, like I said, right now, you're studying business, you're studying nursing, you're studying engineering, you're studying education, your opportunities to use degrees in, in those kinds of fields really are un, unparalleled. They're terrific, terrific opportunities. So uh, new capitalism doesn't mean that uh, uh, there are opportunities. There are absolutely opportunities. Well, that's a lot of me talking. I didn't actually plan to, to go that long. I've gone almost an hour. So I'm going to um, pause here. And now if anyone would like to ask a question, I'd be happy to, uh, to do my best to answer it. And you're just gonna need to unmute yourself and, uh, and take turns. Why doesn't the Leffler curve work? Why doesn't the Leffler curve work? Um, it is, if, if the, the, the best explanation is if you, uh, this, this is gonna sound like a very academic answer, is uh, go read uh, Thorstein Veblen's The Theory of the Leisure Class, which is, uh, you know, and, and the idea is that, you know, the, the economists would tell us that people work for, for sustenance and that the reason that someone who you know, is, is, has, makes $100 a year works hard enough to make 101 is the same reason that someone who makes a million a year works harder and harder to make a million and one dollars that, that, that the motivations are, are the same but in reality it's not true I and mean, we all kind of intuitively know that it's not true uh, the laffer curve operated under the assumption that higher levels of of income tax rates were a disincentive to work that people would be less productive and they were paying higher rates in fact at that point in the process the motivation is putting points on the scoreboard. It, Dr. Kraft, you talked about the fact that Alabama employers that are looking for looking for skilled labor, people with a high school education have a problem with <clears throat> sobriety of their potential labor force because 80% of them uh, can't pass a drug test. Uh, presumably, your graduates uh, also have to take drug tests. What is the percentage of college, college. graduates that fail drug tests when they do an employment application? 
I think Stephen lost his uh, connection. Yeah, we have lost, we have lost Dr. Kraft uh, temporarily. Hopefully he will come back on. Uh, let's see if he will rejoin us. Uh, so, so far I do not see him, but let's give it a second here. Well, it's been an a stimulating talk so far. Um, uh, all right. I, I don't know that I have Dr. Kraft's phone number here handy to call him. Uh, I can me, give it to you, Phil. Well, I'm glad he finished his talk. <laughs> At least we, we got to hear what he had to say. Uh, uh, let me let me uh, check and see if I have his phone number that I can, and so we can give him a call. I'll be right. I'm back. Oh, there he is. Yeah, I, I, I apologize. My my internet went uh, went snafu. Um, I, I apologize for that. So, the, just let me. I guess one more. The the short answer is, uh, it's not the, the higher tax rates tend to not be a disincentive to work because at some point your motivation to work is not really because you want to buy another pair of shoes or you're going to have, you know, surf and turf for dinner tonight. The motivation becomes putting points on the scoreboard. So by and large, people of, of means who tend to hit, who tend to be at these higher tax rates are by and large not working for the money. They're working for the, uh, for the, the glory of having the higher income. And Dr. Kraft, I think you may have, may have missed my question with the uh, internet. Uh, problem. Uh, my question was, was this, you talked about the fact that employers in Alabama have a problem with sobriety and getting uh, uh, good employees at the uh, well, high school educations with uh, decent uh, uh, skills for manufacturing jobs because 80% of them have a positive drug test. Is that something that's confined to that particular demographic group or is uh, inability to pass a simple drug training, something that applies to graduates uh, 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 from college or from your business school? It, it tends to not be as big an issue in terms of percentages, but it's also the, the process of, of, of the nature of the jobs. Most of the people who are in professional ranks don't get tested. Uh, and so it, it's, not, it, it's not something where sobriety is, is valued as much. I mean, you might be particularly concerned if your accountant is, is sober, but generally there are gonna be other ways of determining that other than, than having a, a drug test. You know, I, um, I'm, I've, there's a company that, uh, you know, in, in Shelby County, AC Leg, and they're in the, in the spice business. And so if you ever you know, go to Publix, for example, and buy you know, a roasted chicken, it was probably you know, uh, uh, developed with a, with a rub from based upon their spices. Uh, they have a special cage where they keep the maple oil because maple oil is really, really expensive. And so a, a small mistake in mixing the maple oil can turn into a 10, 20, $100,000 mistake very, very quickly. Maple oil is more valuable than, than, than heroin or liquid gold. This stuff is really just got awful expensive uh, uh, maple oil. So if you want to create the flavor of maple, there are ways you can approximate it. If you want real maple flavor, it, it's, it's going to cost you. And I don't think it's unreasonable for them to want someone to be sober and have a high school degree in order to, to do that. If you're a manufacturer, I don't think it's unreasonable uh, to, uh, to have someone be, be sober to operate a multi-million dollar piece of, of equipment. Uh, yeah, so I, I, that, I, that's I, who I, tends to get tested. And so that's the reason that we know those numbers um, better. Um, yeah, I certainly, certainly, agree with, certainly agree with the need for uh, drug testing. But should we, be, uh, uh, should we create a minimum annual, uh, a minimum guaranteed income to fund people that can't stay off weed for a week to pass the drug test? Uh, that is that is a very fair question, and um, the the and there therein lies the the crux of, of the public policy problem. So we've had different municipalities that have experimented with that. Uh, we've had a, a there was a, a fairly significant I can't remember the city now uh, Canadian 
experiment with guaranteed minimum income uh, and and that you've hit exactly the the crux of the argument it is who's going to uh, who are we going to pay to stay home and how much are we going to pay them and you know the counter argument is well what is the, what are the social costs of uh, of having large groups of people who are unemployed and can't support themselves um, generally we know that what works to grow an economy and to have a successful economic economy is a strong consumer. You hear, you don't hear it as much anymore, but you used to hear a lot of political arguments about, well, who's a job creator? And you know, the one mm. side would say, well, government's not job creators, you know, business are job creators. And the other side would say, well, yeah, but we have to have, you know, the, the, the rules of the road in order to, you know, to have more of these jobs being, being created. Uh, ultimately, if you want to find the job creator, it's a consumer. Uh, what we, I do a study for the Shelby County Chamber about the, uh, and so I end up getting data from you know, several hundred uh, you know, significant companies in, in the region every year as part of that process. And consistently in the data, consistently in every conversation, everyone I ask, you know, when do you create a job? When does that happen? And the answer is, if I've got the business, I'll create the job. There's no amount of regulation. I'd love to have less regulation. There's no amount of taxes. I'd love to have less taxes. But ultimately, if my company has the business, we will create the jobs we need to create. The job creator is the consumer. The job creator is the person who's spending the money. So if you put money in people's hands and they spend it, the economy is going to be doing uh, pretty well. And ultimately, while we'd love for that money to come because they're being productive, and ultimately from an economic standpoint, it doesn't matter. If you put money in someone's hands and they spend it, that's how the economy grows. Um, if, you, uh, doctor. if you were in, in total control of the US government with no limitations, you had, you, you could tell Congress what to do, you were in total charge, how would you solve the national debt? <laughs> well, that's, it's, it's a tough one. I think what you have to start with is to, to, to freeze it at some point and quit adding to it. And I think to do that, you've got to make some, some tough choices around, uh, around, around taxing and, and spending. Uh, there is just, there's, there's much less discretionary spending in the federal uh, budget than people think in terms of, oh, well, why don't we just stop you know, buying you know, $800 hammers and stop overspending for this and there's waste in their graph. And all of that is true. There's lots of waste in the government spending that could be trend, but if you trend it all, ultimately it would not make much of, a, of, of, a, of, a, of an effect. Uh, you're going to have to deal with uh, you know, <clears throat> fixing the entitlements and ultimately we're going to have to have a citizenry that is willing to pay for the government that we want. And so if, if we want services, we want to keep the, the, the poverty rate among the elderly low. So we want to, we want to keep social security in, in, in good shape. We want to be able to take care of our fellow citizens who are disabled. We want to you know, have, we don't want to be in a society where if two kids are walking down the road and they get hit by a, by a car that we're going to take one to the hospital because they're covered by health insurance. We're going to let the other one bleed out. We don't want to live in, and we want to figure out what this is that we're willing, that we want to have in terms of, of how we want our economy to work, what the guardrail should be. Uh, we need to pay for it, which probably means that we're going to have to look um, at this, this idea that somehow taxes are, are an evil that we have to, um, uh, that we have to avoid at all costs. Uh, Dr. Kraft, yeah, I remember one criticism that was made of some of the changes made in tax policy here a couple of years ago was that uh, the incentive to have corporations bring more of their money back from overseas, and this had been done earlier, I believe, in the Bush administration, and it was pointed out that, in fact, much of this went into stock buybacks rather than in increasing productivity or giving employees more money. Well, first of all, what is it that's made stock buybacks something that has become more important, say, compared to 50 years ago for corporations? What, what is it that's affected this environment that makes stock buybacks so important for a company? Sure. Well, 
part of what we have we've tried to do is to give you know in, in our in our corporate governance best practices give the people who are at the top of the company and really everyone at the company people at the top of the company give them the same incentive as 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 a shareholder so most of you know, your, your senior executives in say a fortune 500 company are going to have an economic stake in in the fate of the company stock buybacks increase the value of of the stock that is the the less stock there is in circulation the more valuable it becomes I mean, generally speaking if you, when we hear about you know a stock market report at the end of the day, you turn on the television, they tell you that you know you know X Y Z company closed at two hundred dollars a share today. That means relatively little to the company in terms of of new money because if I go buy a share of stock from the New York Exchange or Nasdaq, I'm not buying it from the company. I'm buying it from you. I'm buying it from somebody else who owns it. You want to sell it? I want to buy it. We you know the market helps us find a, a, a price that we both agree upon. You sell it, I buy it, I now own it. Well, XYZ company doesn't see any of that. It's not the only way that they benefit from the stock price is because of the, the, the stock that they own and that the individuals there at the company may own. And so stock buybacks are, are popular because it increases the value of stock and most of the people making the buyback decisions are stockholders. Uh, Dr. Pratt. The uneducated or the non-college degree immigrant, do they impact the economy and, and they don't, do they fit into the jobs that are required? The, the question I, I couldn't hear completely, I think it was that do, do immigrants um, help the economy or hurt the economy? Uh, immigration has always been- no, the ones without college degrees. The, the ones without college degrees. Uh, generally speaking, immigration has always been an economic positive. Um, immigrants uh, tend to be inexpensive labor, which <laughs> is ultimately a, an economic benefit. You know, we have um, uh, our, our farming industries, for example, depend heavily on, on workers who are willing to come into the United States during uh, you know, uh, times of, of, of harvest. So uh, generally, immigration has always been an economic positive. Now, there are other reasons to be against immigration for socio-cultural reasons. There are a lot, there, you know, there's, uh, in terms of their non-economic arguments to be had uh, either way on immigration, but from an economic standpoint, uh, immigration is, is almost always an economic positive. And we are actually dependent on immigration to have continued population growth. So if you are, um, uh, reliant upon or concerned about social security, uh, you, you should probably be a fan of, of immigration because you want lots of young workers and you want them, those relationships to be normalized and having them paying into the social security system. So, Thank you. Dr. Kraft, uh, what other means would, would you take to, uh, to uh, allow or to allow for the large number of of workers whose jobs have disappeared besides the guaranteed income? What other, are people, uh, are, what other ideas are out there? Well, I think you're, you're, you're gonna have to have additional job growth. You're gonna have to have you know, uh, companies reinvent themselves. You're gonna have to have the, the ability to have the automation. You know, one of the things, if you look, uh, at, you wanna find an instructive uh, model, look at what's happened with India. Now, India has, has problems, they've got, conflicts with, with, with their neighbors. But what, what India did for a generation is they were very aggressive on opening free trade and they were aggressive almost to an irrational point of, uh, of investing in education. I mean, right now, I think there's still, India has more PhDs per capita than any place in the world. They have invested in generations, uh, generation after generation, irrationally almost, in education. And so the, the so you have, you have an incredibly educated population. Part of the, the problem with our federalist system here in the United States is you've got uh, the, the trade being almost exclusively in, in the domain of the federal government, but education being in the, in the domain mm -hmm. of the states. So at the same time where you were, were, were in a more rational system, you would have had 
increasing investment in public education to go along with trade. Because the, the way you win in, in a trade environment is that you create the more high valued employees, the people who can do the higher order work. You educate a higher proportion of your population so that when the, the you know, something like you know, the NAFTA or, or TPP gets implemented or anything, you know, even the, the works we do just straight through like the WTO, uh, the World Trade Organization, all of that should benefit and have particular benefits to a more educated population. But at the same time that we have been you know, pursuing additional trade policies up and you know, in more and more free trade up until you know, a, a few years ago, that was, you know, that was a bipartisan agreement. Trade is good. Trade's a good thing. Uh, up until a few years ago, up until the current administration, you know, trade was a good thing. But we have been curtailing our investment in education. You know, if you go back to, again, looking at Alabama, go back to, say, 1980, 1980, you know, the early 1980s. Um, at my institution, at University of Montevallo or you know, University of Alabama, you would have found that the state was funding about 68 to 78 percent, say 78 cents on the dollar of what it took to educate a, a kid in college. So this, we, we saw having an educated population as a public good. We invested in that, uh, that you know, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an entity, as, as a state. We invested in public education because it helps us all. The more educated people we have, it's, it's good for all of us. And so it, it's, it's a public good. Right now, that number is going to be 28, 29. So what we've done is, is people talk about inflation and the cost of higher education. I understand I'm not, I'm, I'm a, I'm not an unbiased observer of this. This is, this is my field, so I fully you know, accept that. But if you, people talk about inflation in the cost of higher education, in fact, the, the cost hasn't changed that much. The price has changed. The cost hasn't changed. The price has changed. Yeah. And it's what we've done is we have shifted the cost of education, which we saw as a public good, from the public onto people who happened to be fertile 18 years ago. And so we, we've simply shifted that cost from what we used to cover as a collectively, because we all benefit from having an educated population, to, you know, to the families who are you know, trying to give their kids a, a, a better life. And so we have, at the exact time that globalism has increased, trade has become more important, the economic opportunities of being in the world market have been unprecedented over the last, say, 30 years. At that same time, we have actually been curtailing our investment in, in primary, secondary, and higher ed in terms of, of education and making that uh, making that leap into higher ed more and more expensive for families and where it still benefits us all to have a, a, a educated population. We're just not investing in that as a public good the way that we once did. Would you give us a, an, an unbiased um, summary of what the Trump tax bill did? Because if you listen to one side, it did X. And if you listen to the other side, it did Z. So what did it really do? It cut uh, the high end marginal tax rates on, on all across the board with a particular emphasis on people with, with higher income. That is the, the effect was more prominent, the higher your income. And most of the stimulus, it, it sort of had two purposes. One is we just, you know, on, on, on that side of the aisle, they just love tax cuts. And, and that's a good thing. I, mean, I love having lower taxes. Everyone does. Um, and that's so that has as many benefits. Um, the, but the stimulus effect was, was front loaded. Uh, but the accumulative effect is uh, on the deficit will go on as long as the tax cuts uh, remain. So the benefit is, is, is important and it's short lived. I don't know that we really needed it at that moment uh, compared to the cost of, of the deficit. Now, again, you asked for an unbiased view. I tend to be a deficit hawk. So I, so I, I am more worried about deficits than I am short-term stimulus. So I would not have, have supported that, uh, that, that tax cut. What, if you want to target a tax cut for higher impact, the key metric is um, what we call marginal propensity to consume. That is, 
uh, based upon your income, if you got one more dollar than you had today, what would you do with it? You know, what would you do with that? You know, your, your first dollar you're going to spend, you know, to pay your mortgage, support your family, buy food. You know what you're going to do with the first money you get. The question is, what do you do with the next dollar that you get? And how much of it are you going to spend? And how much of it are you going to, you know, squirrel away and, you know, and, and not spend? So if you want to stimulate the economy, the best way to do it is to give it to someone who has the highest possible inclination to spend it. So if I'm going to give you a dollar back in, in taxes, I really want to give it to someone who's going to go out and spend that dollar. I, I mean, my, the, the stimulus is the more the dollar you spend, the better the stimulus is. So when you give a tax break to someone who is relatively wealthy and that, you know, you're going from you know, $2 million this year to $2 million and $1 this year, it's probably not going to have much of an effect. I might spend 15 cents of it. The other 85 cents, I, I squirrel away someplace. So if you really want to have the stimulus effect, you need to have you know, the, the bulk of the impact go to people who are more likely to, to spend the money. That's how you create the stimulation. So the bill created some stimulation, but for, for what we pay and it will continue to pay in the deficit, it could have been much more better targeted if it had uh, perhaps left some of the higher income people where they were and been more focused on on, on having some more significant tax breaks for people who are more likely to go out and spend that money on, on stimulating the economy. Dr. Kraft, you did not mention the corporate tax cut that was in that bill. Uh, wasn't that the primary tax cut? Wasn't that the majority of the bill for corporate uh, tax uh, relief? There was a significant corporate tax relief and that is uh, again, got not necessarily the best way to stimulate the, the economy, but it is, uh, it certainly does stimulate the economy. And, but again, part of, you, you, someone asked earlier if I could be in charge of the United States, gave me full and complete power. Um, let me add one more thing I, I would do with that. I think we're gonna have to deal with, uh, with corporate tax inversions. Uh, that is, that, that's, a, that's a problem that I know the, uh, the Obama administration you know, tried to take some action in that area, but I don't, I don't think it was wholly effective. Um, but a, a tax inversion happens when, say, a large company in the United States uh, buys a small company in Ireland, and then they declare all their income in Ireland, and they pay the taxes in Ireland because the tax rate is lower, but they continue operating and you know, the CEO is still sitting in the United States. Everything is, is the same. It's just a, a, a way of you know, a shenanigan to do to, to lower the, the marginal uh, tax rates that, that companies pay. I think we're going to have to come up with a different system of, of figuring out corporate taxes so that companies are paying taxes where they're, they're, they're situated and where the business is happening as opposed to you know, where a, you know, where they happen to have a PO box somewhere in, in a different part of the world. All right, uh, Dr. Kraft, uh, I thank you very much for these, uh, these thoughts today. Uh, if, unless there's another question, uh, we will see everyone tomorrow and we thank you all for tuning in. So thank you again. Enjoyed it. It's been fun. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Graft. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your day.